All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Public Health Preemption Problem, Key Health Justice Impacts and Updates, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law and the American Society for Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I'm Daniel Wacker. I'll be your host for today's webinar, and I'm the Program Development Associate at the Network for Public Health Law. We strongly encourage you guys to, for attendee participation, so please use the Q&A function down below. If you just click on that button, you'll be able to submit questions to both the panelists, but also feel free to reach out using the chat feature if that is more comfortable for you. Uh, next, I'll pass it off to our moderator, who is Amy Cook, a senior law and policy analyst for the Center for Public Health Law Research at Temple University Beasley School of Law. Amy will be leading us throughout the rest of today's webinar. So Amy, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to have you for this chat. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, I'm a senior law and policy analyst at Temple at the Center for Public Health Law Research, um, and I will be moderating. So any questions that you have, put in the Q&A, and I will make sure they get to the right person. Um, so we will be starting off with, uh, I'll just be doing a quick introduction of our panelists. So um, I guess the next slide is uh, first up. Well, this is not in order. So it'll be uh, Jennifer is um, the deputy director at the Network for Public Health Law in the Western Region Office, and she'll be doing a presentation on preemption and abortion, uh, reproductive rights. Um, we also have Sabrina, um, the law, a law and policy analyst at the center with me, um, and she will be doing a brief overview of our data set and kind of giving a primer on preemption. Um, next, please. Uh, Sterling is also at the center and he will be doing a presentation on preemption and um, race and racism in uh, school curriculum. And then finally, uh, we, and last but not least, we have Adam who will be doing their presentation on um, transgender rights and preemption. So we're going to be starting off with Sabrina. So I will hand it over to her. Great. Um, well, thanks very much to Amy and Daniel for those introductions. Um, as Amy said, I'm a law and policy analyst here at the Center for Public Health Law Research, here today with two of my colleagues, Sterling, Sterling Adam, to talk some about the work that we've been doing researching state preemption laws. To start us off, I'm just going to provide some general background about the center and the methodology that we use, uh, as well as some context about uh, what we're talking about when we talk about preemption and why it matters. Then I'm just going to highlight some key information about our state preemption laws data set before passing it off to Sterling and Adam for a little bit more of a deep dive into the work that we've been doing. Um, next slide, please. So, so our work at the Center for Public Health Law Research starts with the premise that law is an intervention. It shapes behaviors and environments, but not everyone interacts with laws and governing bodies in the same way. And the effects of those interactions uh, and the effect of those interactions are often not equitably distributed. Depending on the law and its targets, some populations experience the effects of those laws more or less acutely or problematically. And yet law is chronically undervaluated. There has historically not been a lot of research into whether laws are helping or hurting or doing anything at all. Uh, next slide. To that end, we at the center are dedicated to advancing the understanding of the role and effects of laws and policies on health, well-being, and equity through the practice of legal epidemiology. Next slide. So what is legal epidemiology? It's a little bit Self-explanatory if you know legal and you know epidemiology, but in essence, it's the scientific study and deployment of law as a factor in the cause, distribution, and prevention of disease and injury in a population. Scientific is the key phrase here because what legal epidemiology seeks to deliver is a quantitative ones and zeros data product that's been developed with quality control, transparency, and replicability in mind. Now, what has brought us here today is the very first step of the practice of legal epidemiology is policy surveillance. Next slide. So policy surveillance is the systematic collection, analysis, and dissemination of laws and policies across jurisdictions or institutions and over time. Next slide. 
So this wheel represents all the steps in the policy surveillance process. We're not going to dive super into detail into all of the individual steps, um, but just wanted to give a general overview of the steps that we followed in creating this data set. So by design, many of the steps in the process were performed redundantly and independently, which improves the quality of the research and coding. Quality control is in the center. This is because there are quality control measures that are implemented at every step of the process. Again, these heightened quality control measures are a part of what makes policy surveillance a scientific approach to collecting the law. And to implement the other key scientific elements of policy surveillance, transparency and replicability, this and all of our data sets are accompanied by a detailed research protocol which lays out um, things like the specific error rates for our quality control process, our research strategy, as well as all of the rules that govern why we coded the laws as we did. The idea being that anyone who sought to replicate our results could do slow. Uh, next slide. So that was just a little bit about the center and the policy surveillance process that we used in creating our data set but to turn to preemption. So what is preemption exactly? It's a legal doctrine that describes when a law at a higher level of government supersedes a conflicting law at a lower level. Federal preemption is rooted in the supremacy clause of the US constitution, which deems federal law the law of the land and invalidates, invalidates conflicting state or local law. Uh, to make this more concrete, here's just a quick example. So think of the federal minimum wage law. The federal minimum wage is 725. States cannot enforce a minimum wage that is less than the federal minimum requirement. Even if they enact, enacted the law lower than that, say 515, the federal minimum would supersede the state law. That's preemption at work because a state imposing a lower minimum would directly contradict the federal law. And just as with federal preemption, states also preempt their own local governments, which is the focus of our project. State local preemption works in the same way to inhibit the lawmaking power of local governments. Next slide. So I mentioned in the last slide that federal preemption authority comes from the US Constitution. But what about state authority? Federal law is largely silent on lawmaking power between states and their localities. It uh, leaves this discretion up to the states themselves. And states have found their authority to preempt local governments from two different concepts, known as Dillon's Rule and Home Rule. States often impose one or the other, and sometimes they have a hybrid of the two. So Dillon's Rule derives from a mid-1800s Iowa Supreme Court decision, which deemed local governments political subdivisions of the state that possess only the powers explicitly granted to them or those that are absolutely necessary. So Dillon's rule ultimately interprets local lawmaking authority very narrowly. You can only do what the state has said you can do in the most simple terms. Home rule, on the other hand, came later and posits that localities have some inherent authority to make law. In general, home rule states give their localities more freedom to legislate than do Dillon's rule states. Uh, next slide. So preemption operates in a number of different ways. We can think of these primary functions as floor, ceiling, and field preemption. Floor preemption sets a minimum legal standard in which the lower level of government can't be any more uh, permissive than the higher level allows. Going back to that minimum wage example, the federal minimum wage is a form of floor preemption. States cannot impose a minimum wage less than 7.25 an hour, but they're not restricted from enacting higher minimums as many states have. Floor preemption is generally thought of as a useful tool in progressive policymaking because it affords minimum protections under the law while still allowing for states um, a certain level of policy experimentation. On the other hand, ceiling preemption sets a maximum threshold beyond which a lower level of government cannot exceed. For example, states are increasingly imposing ceiling preemption on paid sick leave. They prohibit localities from requiring paid sick leave beyond that which is required under state law. And finally, field preemption is when a lower level of government is prohibited from enacting any type of legislation in a particular area of law. At the state local level, think of firearms. You know, some states preempt virtually any local government firearms. Next slide. 
And there's a recent trend often referred to as punitive preemption, which will tack on civil and sometimes criminal punishments when legislators try to enact laws that exceed the authority of local government. Um, sometimes states with these permission provisions even permit local lawmakers to be removed from office. Next slide. So state preemption pervades throughout many different areas of regulation from firearms to taxes to housing to local school policy. The breadth of preemption can in increase the inequitable distribution of the social determination of health. You have the state stepping in to prevent localities from directly responding to the needs of their local con con constituents. And state preemption of local law has been on the rise in recent years which is concerning, particularly in combination with the corresponding rise in punitive preemption. And tracking these laws is vital to understanding state preemption's impact on population health outcomes. Next slide. So this state preemption project was a collaboration between the Center for Public Health Law Research and the National League of Cities. Additional support was provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of the foundation. Next slide. So our project, again, with funding and support from the National League of Cities, compiles features of state local preemption in 15 different areas of law across all 50 states, allowing for a comprehensive snapshot of nationwide trends. This is a longitudinal data set, meaning it tracks changes in law over time, um, covering preemption laws in effect between August 1st, 2019 and November 1st, 2022. The project first began publication in 2019 and has had annual updates since then. Our most recent update was completed with a team of three researchers plus a supervisor. And this team focused on creating this data set covering any laws that have been fully codified as of November, again, November 1st, 2022. We also had an additional team of researchers tracking bills that had been proposed, but not yet passed into the law. And we will be doing our next update later this year. So typically each domain would have its own data set, but this project is unique because all domains are compiled into one data set. This was all purposely done to allow users to have a better, more holistic understanding of preemption trends across states. So after background research and conversations with the National League of Cities, we narrowed the project to the 12 initial domains. We have banned the back box laws covering inquiries into criminal records on employment applications, uh, firearms, mandatory inclusionary zoning, municipal broadband, mandatory paid leave, rent control, and then five tax related domains. Uh, this has subsequently been updated to include 15 domains. Whenever we update, we re-examine our scope in partnership with NLC to figure out what legislative trends would be the most useful to capture. Uh, NLC conducted a survey of organizations and groups involved in preemption. And following this process, our most recent update brought preemption in the space of transgender rights, local law enforcement budgets, and race and racism school curriculum on board. Um, these areas have been, in general, unfortunately, very active over the past two years. And we'll be repeating the scoping process as we proceed with our 2023 update with the continued potential to add additional domains. Um, next slide. Where was I forgot to say next slide earlier, but this is just the list of our five domains. Um, and we'll be repeating the scoping process as we proceed with our 2023 update um, with the continued potential to add additional domains. And this is just something we wanna flag in case anyone here is working in preemption, um, was interested in working, in, it was interested in ways to get involved. So here are just a few key highlights from our 2022 update. So four states passed laws preempting local control over police budgets. Uh, here is a space where we can see a lot of the punitive preemption that I was noting earlier, with states like Texas passing measures that restrict local taxing and annexation powers in response to reductions in local law enforcement budgets. Um, Missouri and Florida passed measures that allowed objections to budget reductions for local law enforcement, with Florida also requiring state government approval of budget reductions. 
Georgia, meanwhile, um, expressly preempts the ability of localities to reduce local law enforcement budgets. So activity in terms of past legislation in other domains was pretty limited as of this 2022 update. Uh, but there were three states which added new preemptive elements to their laws relating to local regulation of firearms. Um, there's a, now a total of 45 states preempting local firearm regulation in some shape or fashion. And there was also then one state, Ohio, which passed a new law prohibiting local governments from passing any laws imposing rent control or rent stabilization on private landlords, bringing that to a total of 31 states currently preempting local rent control or rent st stabilization regulations. But the areas that we definitely saw the most movement was in race and racism in school curriculum and transgender rights. So to that end, I'm going to pass it off to Sterling to start diving a little more deeply into those topics, starting with race and racism in school curriculum. All right. Uh, thank you, Sabrina, for setting that up. Um, yeah. My name is Sterling Johnson. Uh, I'm a legal analyst at the Center for Public Health Law Research. Uh, I'm also a PhD student here at Temple University in the Department of Geography and Urban Studies. Next slide. So the topic that we're going to be thinking about here is, uh, is uh, race and racism, but within the, the understanding of of preemption and, and how it actually functions. I think the first place, uh, first thing that I'm going to talk about is how this actually is working in, in our country. Um, so generally, uh, as Sabrina mentioned, there is the, the understanding of, of something of um, the federal government, the state government, and the local government having a relationship here. Uh, the preemption is working mostly uh, more like the state government is uh, providing the framework for school districts uh, to have their own curriculum um, and decide uh, the rights of parents and, and other other community members um, and what is their role in how a school district would would function. Uh, it's primarily in the statutes um, that most states, uh, every state has a statute of education and it lays out the rights that uh, individual, that school districts uh, have involved, including you know every subject under um, under the sun that, that a school would have. but um, but it's, it is really important that it, it is these laws are really connecting uh, the idea of what is our kind of the commons around the knowledge that, the, the whole state would have. Um, so when we talk about like, the public commons, there are public education, public housing, um, you know, public health. Um, these are some of the spaces that uh, people are attempting to change. Um, next slide. So, you know, I talked about statutes, but there are other ways that that uh, that this. Um, idea of race in the classroom has been have been engaged with and and part of that was of what we were seeing uh, even before 2020 where there was this kind of racial reckoning uh the, the George Floyd um kind of protests uh during during the you know the middle part of 2020 but in 2019 there was this establishment of a commission of African American history education done in Virginia uh this is the, the the kind of the form that many people have asked for the saying that African American history is U.S. history, and there was a, a commission that, that came out of it. Um, there was a, a report that came out of it, uh, just saying how the, the you know the, the historical significance of African Americans could be integrated into the U.S. history curriculum, um, and so th this is sort of the the, the field that um, the, one of the ways that we can think of race in the classroom as as having African American history a part of U.S. history. Next slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I think part part of this is also thinking 
is, is there, there are other ways that people have been thinking about African American history? Um, uh, next slide here. Uh, part of 2020 uh, and some of the, the statutes and laws that came out of it was this understanding that um, there were these things and uh, these um, events in our history. Uh, one of them, for example, is, as you can see, this is what they call the Okoe um, massacre, which occurred in 1920 in Florida outside of Orlando. Um, there was a need to kind of unearth this history uh, in 2020. Uh, Governor DeSantis signed a law stating that that this massacre, as well as uh, the Holocaust, had to be taught in Florida schools. Um, and he even, you know, something like the the newspaper on the date that describes it as race trouble um, does not properly guide us in terms of what actually happened, which was um, this uh, retaliation for Black people attempting to vote before. Next slide. We've also seen at the local level where I'm at in Philadelphia, there are public statues. Uh, there are um, kind of this, these public records across the, this, the, the public sphere, uh, but also in the public education, there has been uh, an, a separate African-American history course, as well as uh, inclusion of, of, of certain events like the move bombing into um, the, the, the curriculum. Uh, so uh, that is at the local level where a school district is making this determination around what they believe should be taught to their students. Next slide. And, you know, I, what we're here, what we hear mostly is that uh, CRT, critical race theory, uh, is the thing that we were talking about. So, right, so uh, I did just want to kind of not say critical race theory until now, because that is the way that it has been uh, situated uh, in the discourse. So critical race theory is a, um, is like a, you know, a very specific type of, uh, type of law, uh, an academic concept that really started in, in law schools. Uh, here for people that are lawyers, you'll, you know that there are critical race theory classes. Um, the idea is that we're talking about race as a social construct uh, that is uh, shows up, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally in our social uh, fabric, which is the laws, the policies, the regulation that shape our shape our laws. So um, here we are thinking about um, critical race theory, but the ways that um, is talked about are often attempting to touch Black history. Next slide. And in 2021, uh, we saw a lot of, a lot of talk about uh, CRT, a lot of movement in, in 2021 and 2022 around um, what you know, many people would, would call uh, critical race theory. Uh, but you know, I think they're um, what that is, is, is a, in, in contest. Um, next slide. And, uh, you know, we love to show some maps. Here is the current status of preemptive local policies um, around what in the law is really said is um, around critical race theory. Um, and then other concepts that are related to some of the theories that um, that critical race theory would represent. And most, and I think some of these, some of what we would think about here, some of what we would think about here is like where they would happen, uh, what is the geographies of it? And I think that that it, sometimes it's surprising. Uh, so that some of the first states that had strong laws, um, what, what they describe as divisive concept laws uh, were Texas, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. Uh, behind there, you did see movement in the South regarding uh, especially their history of slavery uh, and um, you know the, the role of Confederate statues and Confederate and the Confederate general generally as a as a concept. Um, 
if simultaneously you have this contested uh, narratives and histories in the upper plain states and the in the mountain west with south dakota and north dakota and, and then you also see similar things happening with chicano studies in arizona so each space is is really seeing their own um kind of contest of, of what is the the role of history at the local level and, and in terms of the public conscious and what is taught to children next slide Yes, and so we are focused on what is actually happening here, uh, what does the law say, and I'm not going to go into every every uh, statute, but it is it is uh, the important that at least the work that we do at the center is based on what are what is actually in statutes, what is the actual text of it, uh, and. Um, these are some of the the, the concepts that are uh, that are forbidden, prohibited from being taught. Uh, so, one of the concepts is that U.S. is fundamentally racist or sexist. Uh, saying that hard work is a racist concept. Saying that an individual should be should feel discomfort or guilt or shame or anguish uh, because of their race or sex. An individual. There's responsibility for the actions uh, committed in the uh, in the past based on other members of their same race or sex. Uh, these are very different concepts. Uh, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, systemic racism is 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 the concept that is also mentioned that in in the laws. Racial scapegoating scapegoating is also mentioned in the laws. Uh, the vagueness of of these laws in terms of what that actually touches. Uh, is is uh, is is part of the the purpose of the laws, though. Um, we're not. It's really hard to tell what is actually um, what is actually being said or done in, in many of these things, and and um, that goes for the curriculum that's actually being taught, which is wrote, written down. Uh, but we're also talking about uh, what is said in the classroom. So when we are discussing this, where um, if a person mentions that white privilege is a is is a fact uh, is a is a part of life, then that is something that is actionable in these these laws. Um, when we're talking about like how it happens, it's often through um, actually looking at what is in the curriculum, but it also goes towards any reporting from any parents, any students. Um, any community member, uh, anybody that shows up at a school board hearing that has um, has an issue with these as well. Um, next slide. Yeah, so and uh, there's only only references to, to these books in the lab. It's, there are a few official references to these two books. So we go from the vagueness of some of the statutes to to uh, very specific things like the there's a description of the 1619 project specifically to say uh, it, should, it is banned, but is also uh, the its central deep thesis that the United States started in 19, 1619 and is fundamentally a racist uh, society. Um, that concept is banned as well. Um, but it, it's important to see the, the vagueness, but also specificity that we see in this in the statutes. Um, I think uh, something that we don't touch is the fact that there are books being banned in and school districts and in, in hearings across the city, across the nation, um, in individual counties and school districts. Next slide. Yeah, so that's that's what's happening. Uh, you know, I. Uh, and around like what's in the law, uh, but I wanted to just think, just have us, you know, before I end, just uh, have three more minutes, uh, think about like what is actually happening on the ground. Next slide. And I think uh, is best seen in Florida where there is enforcement, uh, where there are guidelines at the Department of Education that is then being taken down to uh, each university uh, to say uh, that if you have any classes that may uh, 
may uh, break the law, then you should probably um, think rethink them. <laughs> and and people are um, faculty that, especially pre tenured faculty, have just taken those those classes out of their um, out of out of the curriculum. So. Um, and others are making are making those decisions or, or planning to go elsewhere outside of some of the southern states where there is more enforcement. Um, some of the enforcement we've seen uh, actions have been in Tennessee and Texas. Uh, some some of the the kind of um, like enforcement that's outside the law is just people being uh, either talked to or fired or stories that have come up in the news, which um, are just anecdotal but they um, have come out of Florida as well, because that is one of the states that has really taken it as a, as a real imperative, as well as recently, most, uh, most recently, Arkansas as well. And uh, next slide. Yeah, and you know, I, I think here we start to think about how laws are, are, are interacting with each other and as well as how are, how is the state interacting with uh, with the local government. Um, Virginia went through a process of integrating black history and African American studies into its into its uh, US history curriculum and uh, in, that was in 2019 in 2022 uh, we saw a <laughs> executive order stating that inherent concepts, uh, critical race theory, uh, any any concept that um, talked about U.S. being fundamentally uh, racist, any um, any any um, kind of investigation of, of racist social contract being um, you know taken as as a prohibited in any of ed in education. So. Um, we're still at a place where we're unclear what that means for the curriculum as it was changed. Uh, only only last year, only finished last year in terms of the, those uh, those processes, and it seems to be seems to have been rolled back. But uh, I think you know one of the points here is it's unclear what the relationship is between the states and each local jurisdiction. I think we're going to. Um, it's not exactly clear what that is, and it's not exactly clear how positive African American history uh, legislation or statutes or anything related to um, teaching racism based on the Holocaust are actually going to um, how those will actually engage with these other uh, CRT critical race theories, uh, you know, laws because they are uh, they are pretty explicit in there talking about systemic racism, critical race theory, and other concepts that are around the basis of social construct. Um, so, um, and next slide. It, the, yeah, nope, okay, nope, go back, sorry. <laughs> that was the next one. That was that was the end of my, of, of my section. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, some of the, some of the things we wanted to think about was, was the fact that, uh, that, this is very. This is a very new area of law. Uh, thinking about like the like where we are uh, talking about history, uh, how memory is contested, and who gets how, how is that actually expressed to uh, to the public? And it's really starting at the school district level in terms of having those conversations. And you know, the point that I did not state, and you know, I wanted to wanted people to kind of see the the kind of ways that this come this has been coming and going and there's like a sh it's a shifting area of laws and there's been forward movement but also back movement uh, but this is the conversation and even in those laws where we're talking about merit meritocracy uh, as a as a concept or or some something says that somebody is inherently better or responsible for the harms of a race or sex uh, in there um, I think or sex is a very interesting concept that is also inside of those laws. Uh, and I think that that's where we are, I want to kind of move us back to um, how we are reading sex and gender and gender identity, sexual orientation, um, and a lot of things having to do with our, our bodies into the current law, which are, um, which I, I would say that 
probably, uh, you know, I will step aside and have Adam and Jen really go into those concepts. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that, Sterling. Um, I'll get into a little bit of how there's overlap here. Uh, my name is Adam Herpelsheimer. I'm a law and policy analyst at the center. Um, I'm also a PhD student. Um, and I'm an adjunct professor, but I'm going to get into transgender rights and preemption. We can go to the next slide. Now, as I think most of us know, the issues of transgender rights have been kind of hot lately. They've been very um, topical. Lots of states are adding a lot of vitriol to the conversation. Now, we're also seeing an abundance of legislation. Um, for this presentation, I want to make clear that our research, our data set, goes to November 1st, 2022. Sabrina already mentioned that, but the reason it's important here is because at the end of 2022, we saw an exponential rise in anti-trans animosity, um, and we're just now getting a lot of those laws passed, and they're not... Or, not getting them they are being passed and they're effective now so our next update will definitely catch a lot of that work but i still want to go through um everything that we found so far now we can go to the next slide now with anti-trans prohibitions they're not all going to be preemption um but preemption is a common tool and what we're seeing is a lot of these anti-trans laws do have a preemptive mechanism and it's showing how um a lot of preemption goes unnoticed. We typically think about it in terms of locality cannot do this, but a lot of times just particular language in a bill or in a law is actually doing the preemption in and of itself. So our data set's gonna focus on three main types of preemption um, and broken down a little bit further. So we can go to the next slide. So first up is the anti-discrimination protections. Now this is the very visibly preemption um, type of preemption uh, in that it's states saying that localities cannot add anything to their anti-discrimination protections. Now this was the case in North Carolina in 2016 with HB2 and it got quite a bit of um, publicity and a lot of pushback. But Currently, a lot of this kind of legislation is really a reaction to the Bostock case from 2020 that kind of ruled that sexual orientation and gender identity are part of sex in terms of sex discrimination. So these laws that refuse to or tell localities that they can't add them explicitly are trying to evade that Bostock ruling in some capacity. Now we go to the next slide. Now we see here that there are two states that currently have these laws, Arkansas and Tennessee. Now, both of those laws were passed before HB2, but there wasn't kind of a um, cultural consensus that they were evil, that didn't get the headlines. Now, North Carolina's was eventually repealed in 2019, um, and but we've seen five states introduce bills since 2021. So the kind of terrain is, interesting to say the least. Now, some states are going the other direction and adding those to their anti-discrimination um, protections. Colorado is a notable example, um, but this year what we've captured is that Michigan tried that very thing, but somehow there was this mechanistic problem about if there was enough signatures on a ballot initiative, blah, blah, blah. There was a court case and they weren't able to get it on the um, uh election or they weren't able to get it on the ballot so um, those kind of movements are still positive and still happening now we go to the next slide a big version of preemption that we're seeing is in the school setting now in that text i call it a moral panic and the reason i call it a moral panic is because these are just recycled anti-gay messaging from the 90s and 2000s now apply to trans. This is about safeguarding children. This is about groomers. This is about um, getting, not wanting people to change your mind or things like that. And we're seeing the exact same tactics that we saw before in terms of the, um, the former gay movement. We're now seeing the former trans movement and things like that. We can go to the next slide. 
Now, the first kind of in-school uh, preemption that I want to look at is uh, in-school curriculum. These first are inclusive school curriculum. These first four states have laws that in some manner prevent teachers or um, uh, curriculum developers from talking about gender identity, usually sexual orientation as well. Sometimes these laws are also involved in the Parental Bill of Rights, where if you're going to talk about gender identity, you have to get approved by the parents. They have to sign off on it. And it's these hurdles that make it so teachers don't teach the things that they should be teaching. Now, the other form of preemption in this area is directly related to the Parental Bill of Rights. And it's something I find much more nefarious. And it's the um, ability to prevent or require um, teachers and educators to notify parents if a student is going by different pronouns or um, is transitioning or is anything social transition related. Now, this is particularly bothersome because a lot of trans students don't feel comfortable telling their parents yet. They don't want to be out in front of their parents, but they feel safe enough at school. So requiring that teachers tell parents puts this obstacle where students aren't going to feel comfortable coming out and they aren't going to be able to live as their authentic selves. Now, as we're seeing in 2023 alone, 87 bills involving education have um, made their way through state legislatures. So this is a super, super um, prevalent issue because again, so much of this is based around this safeguarding children um, and so much of education is regulated by the state. So they have access to this in, in a way that some other things they might not as easily. Let me go to the next slide. Now, what we see more than anything is uh, bans on participation in sports for transgender youth. Now we've seen 19 states total, 11 in 2022 alone, and three states failed in 2022, but since then have been able to overcome or are working on overcoming that still. Um, in Kansas, that happened um, over a gubernatorial veto. So the ways in which this is happening is getting very stark. Now, these participation in sports bills are the kind of bills that say you can only compete on a team that matches your sex assigned at birth. Granted, they'll say things like biological sex or birth certificate sex in states that don't allow for changes in birth certificates. So there's all these obstacles that keep students from being able to participate in sports, which is um, a very important part of both education and social um, learning. Now, as of this week, I think on Monday, 14 state legislatures or 14 state legislators that are trans and non-binary put out a statement um, completely and totally against all of these bills. And it's gotten some attention. So um, again, hopefully some of that movement and momentum can um, combat these laws. We can go to the next slide. Now, the um, back to HB2, the big kind of sticking point that everybody talked about was the bathroom bills. Now, we have three of them um, per our research in effect right now, Oklahoma, North Carolina still, and Alabama. Now, you might be asking, how is North Carolina there? I thought they repealed that. Well, they kept the language for the bathroom bill that segregates all spaces by um, biological sex, but there was a court ruling that says this can't be applied to transgender individuals. So that's positive in the sense that it's not there or it's not um, enforceable, but that's something that can change depending on uh, legislation or litigation. So it's worrisome in and of that. Now, since our research, Arkansas and Idaho have both passed school bathroom bills, but this law in um, North Carolina really represents how far this can be taken because it's not just schools, um, but it applies to all public facilities. And then we have states like Tennessee that have laws not prohibiting people from um, going into the, the bathroom they feel like they should be in, but 
criminalizing um, charges like exposing yourself to a child, which they then apply to anybody entering a bathroom um, that's of their, not of their assigned sex at birth. So um, yeah, this can get pretty serious and pretty um, uh, vitriolic. And we can go to the next slide. The bulk of what we're seeing um, in movement on anti-trans uh, prohibitions is scary. It's gender affirming care bans in their entirety, um, making it so no gender affirming care can be provided to any um, transgender youth in the state. Now, it's often not preemption in of itself, but it's related and it's still very concerning and preemption really opened the door for this kind of um, bans. Next slide. Now, one state matched the criteria for us, and this is Arkansas. Now, Arkansas did this not by saying you can't perform these surgeries, you can't perform this care. They said you can't use public funds for any of this care, or you can't, um, in any state owned or county owned facility, can't provide this care. So they have that level of um, municipal kind of construction there that works in it. Now we see a lot of these bands in public funding in the bands that we see that are just bands. So there's that preemptive element that's still working in um, the prohibitory fashion. But since our research, two states have followed and nine states have non preemptive bands. Now, the one that strikes me as very um, important is that San Diego or <laughs> San Diego, South Dakota law. Now that law doesn't just prohibit gender affirming care, it mandates detransition. So all of the children that already have received gender affirming care must stop and must go on a plan of how to stop. And it's really scary that they're doing those kinds of things because at the same time, some of these bills that are being introduced are um, ranking or bulking the ages up to 25. So it's getting into adults and um, gender affirming care. Others that are going after the insurance mechanisms make it so in theory, nobody could acquire these kinds of services unless they are independently wealthy. So it becomes a huge problem um, in that sense. So we can go on to the next slide. Now you might be thinking, this is very drab. Adam, this looks awful. How can we stay positive? Well, let me say that we can still have hope, that there's still moves to be made um, and there's overwhelming support across the country for transgender issues, but it's these state legislatures that really hamstring everybody with their kind of movement. And we go to the next slide. In 2023 alone, there's been over 490 anti-trans bills introduced. Now that's particularly scary, um, given how small of a percentage us trans people even make in the country but we're seeing this much attention paid to that. So my, um, oh, also this is linking to other forms of LGBTQ discrimination. We've seen drag bans, we've seen um, bans on pride parades. So this connection is growing out of this anti-trans animosity. All right, next slide. So in terms of activism and act, advocacy, I want to recommend two different paths that we can take. First, we have the reactive path. Now, every time a law is passed, organizations like the ACLU and different transgender rights organizations have litigation ready to go. They're going to file those lawsuits and they're going to often win because these laws are unconstitutional and they're immoral. They're awful. Luckily, these organizations are doing the work to combat that when these states are seemingly um, 
passing these kinds of laws without authority. But being reactive only gets us so far because these laws have to come into effect for that to happen and people have to have standing and you have to make the legal arguments so it can be um, burdensome for an already um, cash strapped um, community. So then we have the proactive approach. Now what this does is going to um, uh, committee hearings, going to um, public votes, finding ways to interact on the state and local level in terms of getting these laws to not be passed. Um, there's a lot of work going around where they get different people in different states to go speak and comment, doctors, lawyers, everything, because we kind of all have to fight this together. Now, the last kind of um, proactive approach is passing good laws. Now, I save that and don't even put it in the slide because that's sometimes hard. State legislatures are these big obstacles in the way of passing good legislation, let alone um, federal legislation, which is even more difficult. But that, of course, has to be our focus. Um, in terms of the social detriments of health, law is an important one, and we have to find ways to write good law rather than combating bad law. Now, lastly, I have, next slide, I have a resource page with a, 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 a collection of different things. We have the law and bill tracking um, databases that are all doing great work tracking these laws daily, making spreadsheets, making it easy to contact state legislators to vote against it, and so on and so forth. But then we also have a strong community of organ organizers and commentators. Now, they're from all different um, walks of life, whether they're activists, they're lawyers, they're journalists, um, or researchers. They're doing so much good work in compiling this and organizing people to make um, take a stand. Now, the four I mentioned here um, are favorites of mine, and they all happen to be trans women. So supporting trans voices in this effort is very important. Amplifying trans voices is um, crucial. So that's what I have for us today. And now we're going to, I'm gonna pass it on to Jennifer and reproductive rights. Or no, I'm gonna pass it to Amy to pass it on to Jennifer. Excuse me. Thank you, Adam and Sabrina and Sterling. Um, I just wanna quickly hop on to say before we go into Jen's presentation that we'll be doing a Q and A session at the end. So um, I see there's a lot of chat and a lot of questions in the Q&A. So um, I will be able to direct them to the people at, at the end of the um, session. So wait until then. And um, Jen, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, I also want to make a quick announcement before we jump into the substance of my of my presentation, which is that the slide deck and the recording of this webinar will be posted to the network website once the webinar is concluded. So you will be able to get uh, back to the slides and back to the recording of the presentation. So, so first of all, thank you to, to Sterling, to Sabrina, to Adam for just a great overview. Um, it's been wonderfully informative so far. Uh, as Amy indicated at the top of the hour, my name is Jen Pyatt, and I am the Deputy Director with the Network for Public Health Law's Western Region Office in sunny Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I'll be taking us through some of the legal arguments, litigation, legislation relating to preemption on the abortion front, um, post Dobbs and post Roe uh, in the U.S. Of course, of course, um, there have been a few legal updates over the course of the weekend in this space, particularly with respect to medication abortion, and we will talk about all of that. But first, I think it's important to take in just a little bit of the impact. Uh, next slide. So in the months immediately following the issuance of the Dobbs decision, New York Times reported on a we count analysis indicating that legal abortions in the US fell around 6% by August, 2022. Next slide. But during that same time period, a second JAMA study indicated that requests for self-administered medication abortion increased after the decision. You can see that sort of um, furthest right column, basically all of those are positive and positive maybe by a lot. So uh, potentially a high, a high increase. Um, so uh, next slide. 
So what New York Times then did is that they took these two sort of studies and smushed them together um, into a new assessment in November 2022, indicating essentially that abortion pill use compensated in large part for the drop in legal abortion stateside post-ops. So clearly what we can see from this analysis is that legal abortions, of course, uh, as we could have anticipated, dropped in the United States following revocation of the constitutional right to abortion. But use of abortion medications, and, and primarily from this analysis, abortion medications obtained from aid access from overseas, an overseas organization that provides these medications, help offset some of the more drastic impacts. So, um, I think it's it's somewhat obvious from this data that one of the key legal issues from a preemption perspective is federal preemption regarding medication abortion access. Next slide. So we'll discuss federal preemption. Uh, it, but the legal issue, first and foremost, actually, next slide, implicated discussions about the Food and Drug Administration. So FDA has authority nationally to approve safe and effective drugs before they can enter into interstate commerce. And post Dobbs, legal scholars began considering whether FDA's broad authority could preempt state laws restricting access to medication abortion pills. But we haven't had a chance to fully explore that whole argument yet. And there's a lot of analysis in that space because, next slide, this past Friday, April 7th, uh, a Trump appointed district court judge named Matthew Kaczmarek ruled that FDA unlawfully approved mifepristone, a medication abortion drug in 2000, and issued a ruling pausing that FDA approval amid continuing litigation. Now, immediate impacts right now, there are none uh, for the moment because the decision is on pause until Friday of this week, which is purposefully to allow time for FDA to ask the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals to intervene. Um, and just to be clear from the outset as we're talking about this, this case is an outlier. Uh, it's a complete outlier. According to food and drug law scholars, uh, this case is the only time a court has revoked a new drug approval despite FDA's objection. The only time. So how did this single judge in Amarillo decide to reject national approval of mifepristone? Next slide. Well, uh, we need a little bit of context uh, to talk to talk this through. So, so first of all, FDA originally approved mifepristone under a pathway called subpart H. Um, this approval pathway was an approval pathway aimed at providing more stringent control of drugs than ordinary approval procedures. Um, subpart H was the then existing mechanism back in 2000 for FDA to exert this more stringent control of, of conditions of approval, um, setting certain requirements on that on that approval. Uh, today, subpart H has been replaced with the REMS program, R-E-M-S, and that stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies. Now, FDA has indicated that REMS is designed to ensure that benefits outweigh risks when medications present serious safety concerns. So, okay, somewhat ironically, considering Judge Kaczmarek's decision, subpart H, a pre, a pre, sort of a, a pre-existing um, REMS, uh, if you will, back in 2000, actually gave FDA way more control over mifepristone than other drugs approved via more traditional pathways. But importantly for Judge Kaczmarek, subpart H contains language referring to approval of drugs used for severe illnesses. So Judge Kaczmarek seized upon this language to argue that pregnancy is not an illness. So approving mifepristone for pregnancy is, in his view, unlawful. Additionally, to Judge Kaczmarek, medication abortion drugs provide no meaningful therapeutic benefit above surgical abortion, in that instance, substituting his own judgment for that of FDA. So legal experts who disagree with this interpretation argue that FDA uses the terms illness and condition interchangeably. And pregnancy is a condition. Uh, in that way, FDA has been able to regulate things like pregnancy tests and other products. Nevertheless, Judge Kaczmarek read the language strictly to reject an FDA approval of a drug that has been on the market now for over 20 years in the US. Next slide. 
So one important question to ask when we're, when we're taking a look at this decision is whether the case even needed to get this far. Um, an important ingredient in, in, our, in court cases is something referred to as standing. And standing is basically meant to ensure that courts are hearing real cases where plaintiffs have been injured in some concrete way and need the court help to address it. Otherwise, courts would simply just be issuing their general opinions about all kinds of things with potentially unlimited power to do away with whatever law or whatever executive action they disliked. And that simply gives too much power to the judicial branch. Uh, st so standing doctrine we, we, we use to ensure that real cases are actually being heard. And you can see sort of a more formal definition on the slide, but in a nutshell, standing requires the challenging party in this case, that would be the Anti-Abortion Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine and other organizations, to show that they have been injured in some way or that they imminently will be. And that injury has to be concrete, not speculative. So in this case, of course, Judge Kaczmarek found that the plaintiff medical associations do have standing because if there's no standing, that's it. The case ends there. The court cannot consider the other issues, but he did. Now, numerous legal analysts have disagreed with Judge Kaczmarek's determination on standing. Why? Well, in this case, the complaining medical associations argue, first, that other doctors, not them, not the complaining doctors, other doctors will prescribe mifepristone, that patients of those other doctors will take mifepristone, that those patients of other doctors will experience adverse events related to mifepristone, and that then those patients of other doctors with serious adverse events related to mifepristone will seek out care from alliance doctors, from the plaintiff doctors, who will be overwhelmed and need to divert their energy to provide care to these patients. Now, as you may see by this long chain of necessary events, there's quite a lot of speculation and action required from other people who are not involved in the lawsuit regarding what actually needs to happen for those complaining doctors to actually be hurt at some point, experience injury. Not to mention, that the side effects with mifepristone actually are incredibly rare. So it's even more speculative that these potential harms would actually come to pass. Now, if Judge Kaczmarek's finding on standing is upheld, what that means is the floodgates are open to litigation in the US. It would essentially allow any group of doctors to challenge any drug approval or any agency action in general, because eventually somebody down the line might get hurt from it. These kinds of challenges simply are not permitted by our legal system. And so Judge Kaczmarek likely incorrectly assessed that limitation in this case, should not have gotten this far. Next slide. Now, one additional item to consider on the preemption front, which appeared in Judge Kaczmarek's decision, is the Federal Comstock Act of 1873. Um, this is an act which has not been enforced in close to 100 years, but which has cropped back up in discussions lately because of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. As you can see from the text on the slide before you, the act states that items intended for producing abortion are non-mailable and they cannot be conveyed by mail or by common carrier. Okay, so on a plain reading of the statute, it might be easy to assume that medication abortion pills cannot be mailed per federal law. And that's exactly the determination that Judge Kaczmarek made, that FDA's mifepristone approval enabled violation of federal law by supporting the unlawful mailing of medication abortion pills. Next slide. But there are dueling interpretations on this point as well. The Department of Justice actually issued a very different interpretation of the Comstock Act on December 23rd, 2022, concluding that actually courts have long read an unlawful requirement into the law, uh, prohibiting in essence mailing of material for unlawful uses, unlawful abortions, unlawful purposes, that's what's really prohibited by the act. And that's because this interpretation is necessary to prevent the Comstock Act from essentially making absolutely everything non-mailable. If you'll go back to the last slide for just one second. 
there's if you look at the the first sort of sub paragraph here you can see this language here every article or thing designed adapted whoa okay so people can adapt things to whatever ends they end up using right and you as the mailer have no idea what they're going to eventually adapt that item to do so reading in that unlawful requirement actually is necessary to protect everybody using the mails from for being able to actually mail things and not running afoul of breaking federal law next slide so in addition to that sort of interpretation, DOJ also concluded that the mere mailing of medication abortion pills does not indicate that they're going to be used in an unlawful abortion. There are many exceptions, even in states that do outlaw abortion. Uh, there are many reasons why these pills might be mailed that are not for facilitating an unlawful abortion. So therefore, there's no immediate violation of the Comstock Act just by merely shipping those pills. Next slide. So <laughs> these interesting legal issues aside, this is not, of course, the entirety of the complicated story here. There has to be more going on. Um, and mere minutes after Judge Kazmarek issued his decision, actually, Judge Thomas O. Rice in the Eastern District of Washington issued a completely separate decision blocking FDA from altering the status quo with respect to Mifepristone. So 17 states and DC had filed this separate lawsuit seeking to eliminate some restrictions, those, those REMS requirements uh, on Mifepristone that FDA continued to have in place, seeking to make the drug actually even more available nationwide. So this was really the opposite of the, of the uh, Amarillo case where they're seeking to tamp down on it. Um, and Judge Rice actually agreed in part with the states, finding that FDA's limitations on mifepristone were arbitrary. So when combined with Judge Kazmarek's decision, the outcome is that you have two federal district courts telling the FDA that it needs to take completely polar opposite actions with respect to mifepristone. Next slide. Okay, so where do these cases leave mifepristone legally for the moment? Well, if Judge Kaczmarek's decision goes into effect on Friday without the Fifth Circuit doing anything, then the legal status of mifepristone is going to be very unclear and largely dependent on what FDA decides to do. Uh, and that's because there's no way for FDA to actually permissibly comply with both of these rulings at the same time. If it performs under Judge Rice's ruling and changes nothing with respect to mifepristone access in those 17 states, then it arguably will not have abided by Judge Kaczmarek's ruling pausing mifepristone's approval nationwide. Though, to to be fair, FDA does have some enforcement discretion for seeking out violations, but again, um, that's probably not fully complying potentially with that order. Um, and if it does seek immediately to change the status of mifepristone's approval pursuant to Judge Kaczmarek's order, then it's violating Judge Rice's order not to change mifepristone's accessibility in the, in the challenging states. So in this situation, it's entirely possible that clarification might be sought from the U.S. Supreme Court as to where we actually stand with respect to mifepristone's legality. Next slide. Now, of course, potential FDA and Comstock Act preemption are not the only preemption issues regarding abortion from a federal perspective. Another key issue in play here is the interpretation of the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, which requires most U.S. hospitals to provide screening and stabilizing emergency care to individuals presenting at emergency departments with emergency medical conditions. So soon after Dobbs, HHS confirmed that physicians may conclude life-saving abortion care is necessary under EMTALA in order to stabilize, to provide that stabilizing emergency care. Um, this arguably would apply even in states banning abortion because EMTALA, as federal law, also um, expressly preempts conflicting state laws. Of course, lawsuits were filed. Uh, in early decisions in Texas and in Idaho, federal district courts issued, again, decisions with contradictory outcomes. The Texas District Court found that HHS exceeded its authority when it issued abor abortion guidance related to EMTALA and blocked the guidance from applying in the state of Texas. 
in Idaho, uh, a district court judge blocked actually an Idaho abortion ban, making it impossible for doctors in the state to comply with both the Idaho law and EMTALA. So litigation in both cases is continuing, uh, and the Texas decision at this point has been appealed to the Fifth Circuit. Next slide. Now, additionally, abortion as an issue is beginning to see some action on the preemption front at the state and local levels as well. It's not all federal. Next. So let's talk for a moment about prosecutorial discretion. Prosecutors are generally elected officials with near absolute discretion over when to prosecute individuals for crimes. Uh, post Dobbs, over 90 elected prosecutors in abortion hostile states across the country pledged not to enforce their state restrictions or uh, their state abortion restrictions or bans. Uh, as well, some, some local city councils and police chiefs also issued memos providing for the deprioritization of police enforcement, enforcement of abortion bans. But local prosecutors taking this tack are not immune from blowback when this happens. So um, key example, recently, Governor Ron DeSantis, again, Florida, uh, suspended Florida prosecutor Andrew Warren from his elected post in Hillsborough County after he clarified that he would not prosecute abortion seekers or providers. Warren has since sued DeSantis in federal court for reinstatement. That litigation is ongoing. Um, but while that example focuses on a state executive official, a governor, uh, moving to preempt local authority regarding abortions, state legislatures are also starting to take action in this space. Next slide. So take, for example, Texas. On April 5th, just last week, the Texas Senate passed Senate Bill 20, which seeks to punish prosecutors who may be using their enforcement discretion to avoid prosecuting individuals for abortion-related crimes. The, the actual text of the applicable section is in the, in the white on the slide there, um, stating expressly that a prosecuting attorney may not adopt or enforce a policy under which the prosecuting attorney refuses to prosecute a class or type of criminal offense for any reason other than to comply with a court order, essentially. The bill makes this action by a prosecuting attorney official misconduct justifying removal. Now, while the bill has not passed the Texas House yet, uh, it's, it's possible that it will. It could become law quickly. Next slide. So while some local actions have sought to, to protect abortion access, prosecutorial discretion, uh, other localities may actually have acted in attempts to restrict abortion access post-ops, and they then find themselves facing state preemption as well. So New Mexico is, is a, a prime example for this. In New Mexico, a series of eastern New Mexico localities, including Roosevelt County, Lee County, Hobbs and Clovis actually enacted ordinances restricting access to abortion, um, some of them referring to that Comstock Act of 1873. The New Mexico state legislature, governor, and Supreme Court all acted to reject these local restrictions. So the legislature passed and governor signed House Bill 7, which prohibits localities from denying, restricting, or interfering with a person's ability to access or provide reproductive health care or gender affirming health care. And the New Mexico Supreme Court suspended the local ordinances which restricted access to abortion. Next slide. So that was a lot of information, um, but I'm looking forward to the q and I will turn things back over to Daniel shortly and then we'll jump right into it. Yeah, I'll actually toss it back to Amy to open up for Q&A, but feel free guys to submit all your questions in the Q&A feature or use the chat as well. Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, I saw there were a lot of questions asked in the um, chat and the Q&A that have already been answered. But if anyone wants to resubmit, just so everyone else can hear, uh, please feel free. Um, or if anyone has other questions, please submit so we can direct to the correct person and have everyone um, hear the answer. So right now, let's see. Um, Let's see, I have, okay, so one of the other questions that was asked, that was answered, but we'll have everyone kind of um, here, was, um, can you explain the line between preemption and not preemption, but close with the gender affirming care bans? 
So Adam, I think that would be for you. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and take this one. And it is a, a, a fine tuned point because at the end of the day, preemption is just this legal mechanism that isn't always as explicit as we like to make it seem. Um, when I mentioned with the um, the first um, kind of preemption, it's very clearly locality can't do this. Well, in something like a gender affirming care ban, localities don't really have the power to say you can do this because that authority is already kind of assumed unless it's deemed illegal. So when a state says something like you cannot perform these services, you can't do this, localities are just hamstrung. It's not that they can't pass a law, it's just that they can't do that thing or the people in the locality can't do that thing. Now, what we are seeing is that there's there's municipally constructed ways that that does happen. So whether it's banning federal funding or state funding from going to these services, or if it's something like they can't be done in state or county um, facilities, then that is preventing localities from being able to make those um, public health decisions. Now, this is particularly um, um, important because we found that so much good public health law comes at the local level. So when localities aren't able to kind of um, uh, take funds from one area to start um, funding gender affirming care services, then they are kind of not able to best serve their population. So I know that's kind of a difficult um, technical legal answer, but I hope that kind of makes it a little bit clearer. Like we see these bans in um, public funding a lot of times, even though there's already a ban on the services, they just want to cover their bases. But a ban just in and of itself isn't preemption, even though it's awful. Thank you. Um, and I think this one is for Jen. Um, with regards to the various abortion laws and policies by state, does the network have a report that details the law and policies restrictions by state that can be shared when needed? Um, I also do want to plug that we have an abortion data set from the center as well, which covers 15 areas of um, abortion restrictions. So if you go to our website, you'll see that. But sorry, turn it over to Jen now. No, Amy, that's great. Um, I We do have a number of different resources addressing abortion post jobs on the network's website. Um, we do not, the network does not have one resource cataloging all state laws and restrictions, but uh, I would point folks who are looking for that kind of information to the Center for Reproductive, uh, to the Center for Reproductive Rights. They have an amazing um, map, interactive map called After Roe Fell, which details all the state laws and, and kind of how hostile they are towards abortion or not. Um, Guttmacher Institute also does some tracking. Um, we have individual resources. We have one resources, one resource tracking uh, state constitutional interpretations, state statutes and constitutional language that protect abortion. So there's a ton of resources um, out there that can help with whatever you're, you're specifically looking for on that point. Um, yes, thank you. And also, I think Adam put the um, link to our data set, this is such a plug <laughs> in there, but we also have a post Dobbs abortion data set that looks at the laws post Dobbs. It looks so, like Deanna from our center also put it in the chat. So okay, shout out to Deanna. You, thank you. Um, okay, I think there was a question also for, um, I saw one that was related to Sterling's presentation. Um, do So this was, do these preemptive laws on race education prevent schools from offering an elective course that includes um, in its curriculum, these banned topics. So I think that would go to Sterling. I think that's really important. I mean, the short answer is no. Uh, the, law, the laws are regarding any sort of public funding to um, to have any kind of course included or, or outside or inside of the, the, um, the, the curriculum. Uh, so it's, uh, and then that that's kind of the point it, it's it's not that they're that they're saying any course um it's not that they're saying that um these are the things that person must learn it's that really they don't want any public funding being used for uh for this type of education and i think that's where it, there is this fuzzy fuzzy space around what actually are we talking about um 
I think the best example are in the states where their secondary education, um, sorry, post-secondary, where we're talking about universities, like University of Florida, you know, University of Florida, Florida State are universities that where the professors are taking some of their courses off, off um, you know, Kentucky um, is another example where um, there's places have a great history of, of college courses that are teaching, uh, you know, race and um, race in the United States and, and those professors, which I feel like I, I know a few are, feel, feel very, um, feel very, very intimidated by these laws. Um, so not even as elective, that's, that's, that, that's to answer the question. All right, thank you. Um, and I guess, Adam, I see you're answering this in the chat, but also there was a question about um, initiatives investigating the health implications of anti-trans, anti-LGBT laws that are being passed um, and substance abuse, of course, being one of the huge issues. Yeah, with substance abuse, I don't know of any studies in particular, um, but there's lots of work on the disproportionate impact that substance abuse has on the queer community. Um, but in terms of what kind of general um, applications of legal epidemiology do we see to these issues? Well, with gender affirming care, we're definitely seeing the um, psychosocial impact of withholding care, um, of not being able to participate in sports, of all of these ways in which trans um, engagement in the in the world and their community is um, hindered. You can see those effects um, on their um, their health in general. So it's just a matter of finding those ways to study such a marginalized community um, because I mean it's not like there's just this gold mine of funding for um, trans inclusive studies or um, queer in general. So those those health impacts are there. It's just a matter of uncovering them and really being able to dedicate resources to them. Um, I think, and this would be both for Sterling and Adam, I guess um, a question about what about a parent's choice for their child to take a course or take action. Could they sue because of the denial of being able to do so? Well, I think they could definitely sue. I mean, we live in a lawsuit happy world, but whether it would go anywhere would be another matter. And I think that could be difficult because in terms of education policy at the state level, laws are assumed to have a um, reasonable uh, application to education. We we give deference to the state legislatures in that um, that crucial um, aspect of governance. So if they're automatically assumed to have their constituents in mind, it becomes harder to say, well, they're not providing this, so are they really? And especially with the composition of courts and the composition of the legal um, community more broadly, it gets difficult to make those kind of claims in a way that would be um, substantive. But um, I think at the local level, yes, that's very plausible in going to school board meetings, running for school board, finding ways to include um, positive um, education materials. And really, all of this preemption is a reaction to that. We saw people getting in there and including um, critical race theory um, content and topics in the curriculum and being trans inclusive and being queer inclusive. And then once that came out, there was this, this absolute backlash and it's the worst thing that ever happened. So we have to get rid of it. Um, and that kind of takeover of the local school board um, uh, composition has been uh, stark. Yeah, I think understanding the timeline here is 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 what I what I want to put forward. Uh, so the the current laws and statutes are a reaction to the Ford movement and and uh, you know uh, gay straight alliances and uh, it, at schools, um, black history education and, and all the states that I, that not all the states, but many of the states that I mentioned that have anti CRT laws, uh, there was positive movement, 
around the, the teaching of Chicano and Black studies in Texas and Black studies in, in Kentucky um, and, and, you know, Native studies in, in South Dakota. So there's, there, there um, this is a, a reaction to, to some of the, some of the, the organizing and policy movement, but also some of the lawsuits that were brought, um, you know, forcing them to include the, the, the study. And I think, um, I mean, we, it was met, Adam mentioned the ACLU, uh, but like ACLU has been putting forward, um, you know, the, this thing that has put forward, you know, based on some of the, uh, the interpretations of sex discrimination, you know, one, one of those cases is, is in Bucks County saying that, um, transgender students are being discriminated against and being made a hostile environment because uh, the school board there and the students there and, and also there are there's bullying and, and, and a harassment that's going on that is not, not helping those students be protected as well. So um, the the legal battles are, are real. Um, it is not just um, just one side, it's, it's, it's quite contested. And that's why, it, you know, I guess that's the, the message I want to come out of this. It's, um, it's a con it's a contest. It's I mean I feel pretty um, pretty encouraged by the amount of movement being done on on at the dozens of levels um, that are around um, abortion, uh, trans rights, and and Black history, and as well as uh, Native history, Chicano history. You know the histories of of, uh, of people that have often been marginalized in our in, in the United to, States. To um, piggyback off that, there's another question in the chat about. Um, if there's been pushback to gender studies programs, and absolutely, um, the ways in which Florida is making a mess of gender studies at the collegiate level is absurd right now. Um, and yes, there's been so much push and this just this anti intellectual just um, anger at anything critical in this kind of peda peda pedagogical um, fashion has been immense. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I did just want to just again spread this out. I know that we've been talking about specifically kind of like black states, transgender, but it is a, a, an offense against every person. So when we're talking about your your ability to any pregnant person that that that, that may have a pregnancy does not go to term like is at risk in this when it comes to uh, the the um, women in sports legislation. Uh, it is about checking every woman's uh, menstrual cycle, right? So it is not just if you're transgendered, it seems to be every single person is at risk uh, if you're a menstruating person, right? So um, I, we're getting close to time. So I just have two quick right. ones that I wanted to touch on. Um, someone asked how we would recommend learning about preemption issues affecting public health issues not yet covered by your project. Um, and so I just wanted to put in um, that we uh, have ourselves looked at um, the Local Solutions Support Center and National League of Cities are both great resources for preemption. Um, and I know if anyone has any, um, you know, if, if you are interested in more in-depth, we do, our map is very broad, but we do, um, do rely and look on secondary sources that go more in-depth on certain topics. So we, you can always contact us too um, if you have any questions. And then um, the last question, I think it's positive to end on a positive note is, um, what are the best contemporary examples of preemptive laws that enable equity and social justice? Uh, and enable, enable what I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Equity and social justice. Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> Um, I, I can point directly back to my presentation to that New Mexico law that the New Mexico legislature passed to make sure that people can continue to have access to abortion and to to, to gender transition care um, and not be blocked by um, by localities that want to prevent that access. Um, also, you know, the flip side of the abortion argument with respect to FDA being able to preempt state laws um, barring medication abortion access. You know, if we get to see the flip side of that argument, I think it's a really solid argument. Um, so but just two quick examples there. Yeah, and I would also say something like um, states requiring paid leave um, for their employers, uh, private and public employees um, is also an example of how preemption can be used in a good sense as well. well. And this kind of gets to that same concept I brought up that 
so many things are preemption. We just don't label it preemption. So when a state says you can't do this, then a locality can't pass a law where they could do this. So um, the flip side of the anti-discrimination protections, if a state like Colorado adds gender identity and sexual orientation, then cities aren't allowed to um, not protect. So uh, it kind of gets into that, like what's happening, who gets to do what. Um, so it's all about passing good law. Thank you, everyone. I think we're at time, so I'll hand it back over to um, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for your participation in today's webinar. I know I really had an amazing time and learned a lot, so I hope you all did too. I just want to take a quick thank you to our moderators and panelists for presenting today. And so then just a couple of final notes for our attendees. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to attend our Network for Public Health National Conference, which is this October, uh, here where I am right now in Minneapolis. Um, it's There are five tracks with some incredible programming in store, and we really look forward to seeing you there. But finally, to wrap up, um, all attendees will be receiving an email with the webinar slides as well as a copy of the chat logs, as I saw some people requesting in chat. Um, and that should be available about a week after the webinar ends, as well as a video recording of the entire webinar will be on YouTube and the webinar site. Also, since this is a CLE creditable webinar, you should be receiving an email from ASLME in the next couple of days to start the processing for CLE credits. But other than that, that concludes today's webinar. So thank you all for attending and have a great day. Thanks everyone.